Thank you, Father, for your precious word and the things that you left there for us to discover uh, and to use in our lives in service to you. We ask that your spirit open our hearts and our minds to the things that we will consider this morning, that they may be a source of blessing and challenge in uh, spiritual growth. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Continuing in our letters to the seven churches, we're going to deal with fire attire first. And picking up in Revelation chapter 2, verse 18. And to the angel in Thyatira write, These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a fire, flame of fire, and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. And I will give to each one of you according to your works. Now to you, I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have till I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with an iron rod. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels, as I also have received from my father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the, seven, to the churches. Uh, Thyatira is 40 miles west of our last church, which is Pergamum, and is a much smaller city. It was established as a Macedonian colony under Alexander the Great after the destruction of the Persian Empire. It is a rich agricultural area and was famous for its manufacture of purple dye. <laughs> there are numerous references in secular literature of this period of the trade guilds which manufactured cloth. It's remarkable that Christ singled out this very unremarkable and obscure city and church for such an important letter. In my mind, this tends to support the argument that these letters are more about the future church than these individual churches. The message certainly reaches beyond the immediate circumstances of the church at Thyatira. There's only one other mention of this church in scripture, and that's in Acts 16, where the conversion of Lydia is recorded. And here we have that, Acts 16, 14. <clears throat> now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple dye from the city of Thyatira, who worshiped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her husband were baptized, she begged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. There's no record in scripture of evangelism in Thyatira. And it may be it was Lydia who brought the gospel to her city. Her role as a seller of purple indicates that she was a representative of the thriving trade in purple cloth originating in Thyatira. This letter, the longest of the seven, may have been to the fruit of her witness. 
And all is not well in Thyatira, as his letter is one of the most severe of the seven epistles. Verse 18, and to the angel of the third church in Thyatira write, these things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, his feet like fine brass. <clears throat> The description or characterization of Jesus is interesting in that he sees the necessity of defining his deity. The Son of God is used as his title in contrast to the Son of Man, which was used back in chapter 1. This is in keeping with the judgment pronounced upon this church. Their diversion from true worship was so serious that Christ is calling for a reiteration of his deity. The eyes like a flame seek, speaks of burning indignation and purifying judgment. In a way, his feet are declared to be like fine, in a similar way, his feet are declared to be like fine brass. The word that's translated as fine brass is interesting in that it represents an alloy of fine metals such as gold and silver, brass, or copper that was characterized more for its brilliance than its content. The brilliant appearance enhances the revelation of Christ as judge. Verse 19, I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Though much is wrong in Thyatira. The believers are commended for their love, their faith, their service, and perseverance. The term, the last or more than the first, seems to say they're doing more as time went on rather than less, like the church at Ephesus. Love is, of course, agape, which we have previously established as a higher form of love, and even classified as the same love demonstrated by God that is not based on the attributes of the object of the love or what we've been calling unconditional love. Service is diakonia, a word that means service at the direction of others and is sometimes translated ministry. It comes from the same word from which we get deacon. The definition and the context suggests this is obedience to the guiding of the Spirit of God. Faith is pistis and means a state of certainty in regard to belief. Patience is hypomone, which we translate as endurance or steadfastness. At some portion, at least some portion of the church of Thyatira had it right. They demonstrated obedience to the truth. They experienced the fruit of the Spirit as seen in their love. They produced divine good as seen in the word for service. They demonstrated faith in all these things and were steadfast in their faith and in the truth. But Thyatira had serious problems in spite of this. Verse 20. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allowed that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my, my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I give, gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. Jesus' major condemnation concerned that woman Jezebel, who claimed to be a prophetess and taught believers to take part in sexual immorality, that accompanied pagan religion and to eat food sacrificed to idols. What was acceptable to that society was abhorred by Christ. Their departure from morality had gone on for some time as suggested by verse 21. In some texts, the word translated that woman 
is augmented by su, which changes the meaning slightly to maybe thy woman or thy wife. From this, some deduce that Jezebel of Thyatira might have been the wife of the pastor to whom this was addressed. There was probably no woman named Jezebel, but evidently there was a woman within the church that acted in the capacity of Jezebel in the history of Israel. The church in Thyatira may have first heard the gospel from Lydia, converted through Paul's ministry. Interestingly now, a woman, a self-proclaimed prophetess, was influencing the church. Her name, Jezebel, suggests that she was corrupting the Thyatira church, much like Ahab's wife, Jezebel, corrupted Israel, which is the reference Christ is making here. We see this in 1 Kings 16, 29. In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, the son of Omri, became king over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria 22 years. Now Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. And it came to pass, as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took his, as wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ithbaal, king of the Sidonians. And he went and served Baal and worshipped him. Then he set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a wooden image. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all of the kings of Israel who were before him. And they weren't angels. All right, pay attention because it's going to get a little complicated now. Ahab was one of Israel's worst kings, and under the leadership of his wife Jezebel, they led Israel into idolatry. She is one of the most evil characters in Scripture. She attempted to combine the worship of the idol Baal with the true worship of the Lord and, in effect, destroy it. She had a most unenviable record of evil. She killed practically all the prophets of the Lord and tried to kill the prophet Elijah. Thus, she was singled out by Elijah for a special prophecy that she would become, she would come to a sudden end and that her body would be eaten by dogs, which was fulfilled in 2 Kings 9, 33 through 35. She is considered the epitome of subtle corruption and the symbol of immorality and idolatry. The worship of Baal incorporated the worship of the Lord, or more accurately, the idolatry of Baal was incorporated into the worship of the one true God in a manner that commingled the two systems. In other words, there was still the outward appearance of true worship, but below that veneer was idolatry associated with the worship of other gods. Keep that definition in mind as we relate this to church history. <clears throat> there are three areas of application we must deal with. The church of Thyatira, Israel, and the church in history. And there are two levels of application, literal level and the figurative. Jezebel seduced the Israelites into a form of idolatry, which included sexual immorality and the eating of things sacrificed to idols, both violations of the law. Sexual immorality was introduced into the society and even worship. Fornication is mentioned in many places in Revelation. But this is the only place it is viewed as adultery. What results from this is adultery in a literal sense with the destruction of the family unit and spiritual adultery in the sense that Israel has violated her marriage vows to the Lord 
<clears throat> and is worshiping false gods, idolatry. In the context of the church at Thyatira, there was a Jezebel person, almost certainly a woman, and perhaps even the wife of the pastor of the church at Thyatira. She is influencing the church into adopting the pagan practices of the area and commingling these practices with true worship. They were therefore not only permitted to participate in idolatrous feasts by eating a thing sacrificed to idols, but they were instructed to take part in the immorality that characterized the worship of idols. The boundaries that separated the church from the wicked world around them were broken down. According to verse 21, she was giving space or time to repent, and she did not do so. As a result, a terrible judgment is pronounced on her, and she will be cast into a bed. The word can be translated a bed of affliction or one that carries a sick person. And those who shared in her deeds will be cast into great tribulation. The word translated with refers to an association with the deeds or practices. And that term great tribulation is the same term used over Matthew 24, 21 and Revelation 7, 14, which there refers to our subject, or at least the second half called the great tribulation. <clears throat> yes, it's risky to make word connections like this. They may be accurate or they may not. So I don't want to be too dogmatic here, but I don't think the terms used here are accidental. It looks like this church and its Jezebel practice of idolatry is sick and will enter the tribulation when viewed in the context of the modern church. But we're told that the church is not appointed to wrath. First Thessalonians 5, 1 Thessalonians 5.1. And this is our rapture passage. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfect, perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, <clears throat> and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, and let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love as a helmet, the hope of salvation. <clears throat> For God did not appoint us to wrath, but it, to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us that when whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. The church is not appointed to wrath, but will be delivered, which is the meaning of the word salvation in this context. However, the church in Thyatira looks like it will experience great tribulation, either literally during the second century or the church in history represented symbolically by Thyatira. In Revelation 2.23, Christ says he will kill her children with death. And this is a very strong pronouncement on top of what he's already said. I thought the double reference kill and death was very interesting. The first is a word that refers to the denial of human life or what we would normally think of as physical death. But the second term, with death, is a Greek word that refers to immortality, which in this context, I believe, suggests they do not have eternal life like believers do 
and experience, and they experience the second death associated with unbelievers at the last judgment. <clears throat> Christ physically kills them, and they also die the second death. I've read a lot in the text here, but I think this is not unreasonable. The message to the church at Thyatira seems to foreshadow that period in church history known as the Dark Ages from A.D. 590 to 1517. Almost 1,000 years of darkness preceding the Protestant Reformation. In that period, the church became extremely corrupt as it sought to combine Christianity with pagan philosophy and heathen religious practices. Much of the ritual of the church of that period is directly traceable to heathen rituals. During this period began the exaltation of Mary, the mother of our Lord. She was elevated to a plane of female deity through whom intercession to God could be made and apart from whose favor there can be no salvation. The prominence of the female Jezebel in Thyatira anticipates the prominence of this unscriptural exaltation of Mary. Along with this, the church experienced spiritual depravity, and idols in the form of religious statues and icons became commonplace in Christian churches. Not only did spiritual fornication result, but we also had gross immorality where the clergy and even the Pope took wives and mistresses in violation of their vows of chastity. Nephews of the cardinals and the Pope were often given positions of power within the ecclesiastical system and even ordained to succeed them when they died. So we have both literal and spiritual fornication in the church during this period as the church sinned against its covenant relationship with the Lord. The church is also accused of eating things sacrificed to idols. In the context of Thyatira, that referred not only to eating of things sacrificed to idols, but also participating in these practices as they were incorporated into the Christian church by this Jezebel person. In the historical context of the church, it was this period of the Dark Ages when the church changed the meaning of the Lord's table from one of remembrance to a re-sacrificing of Christ in the Eucharist each time it was celebrated. It was during this time the host, as transformed literally into the body and blood of Christ, came into doctrinal standing within the church. It is likely this reference to eating things sacrificed to idols looks forward to this future idolatrous practice. The Protestant Reformation corrected this and changed it back to the biblical correct remembrance rather than a literal sacrifice. The Bible tells us Christ was sacrificed once for all, and repeating it as another literal sacrifice in the Eucharist is not biblical. Hebrews deals with this subject. In Chapter 10, verse 11, it says, but this man, after he was offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. And in Hebrews 6, 6, they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. Let me remind you that even though all this was going on, Christ still committed this church. He said, I know your works, love, patience, faith, and your patience, and as for your love, service, faith, and your patience, and as for your works, the least are more than the first. Even though the church had many very serious problems, obviously, there remained a pivot of true believers within the church that remained faithful to the truth in spite of the ecclesiastical system they were a part of. They were characterized by selfless service and faith of which God is a rewarder without glossing over the evil inherent to the system as a whole. 
That reference to the last more than the first suggests to me the possibility that within the church were the strong, but probably very small, pivotal believers who went largely unrecognized in human history. But the Lord knows their deeds, and they will be recognized at the Bema Judgment, for he is the one who searches the minds and hearts. Thyatira Tower is a lesson to anyone who dares to corrupt the minds and the hearts of believers with false doctrines, especially idolatry. Verse 24, Revelation chapter 2. Now to you I say, and to the rest in Thyatira Tower, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of faith, Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast to what you have till I come. Here we have an exhortation to the godly element of Thyatira. For the first time, a pivot is singled out from among the whole as being a true testimony for Christ. They are described as many as do not have this doctrine who have not known the depths of Satan. They are exhorted to hold fast to that truth until he comes. And this is the first reference in Revelation to the actual return of our Lord. Even engulfed in an apostate system, this church has hope. Verse 26. And he who, who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. We previously established that the overcomers were born again believers. Verse 27, he says, he shall rule them with an iron rod. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessel. And I also have received from my father and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Note the following details concerning these overcomers. They're given power over the nations. They rule them, the nations, with an iron rod. They shall dash to pieces like potter's vessels. Authority received was from my father, and they are given the morning star. <clears throat> Church age believers in resurrection bodies will have responsibilities in the millennium. Not all, but some clearly do. Certain resurrected believers who advanced spiritually and were used mightily by the Lord during the church age will be given positions of authority and leadership during the millennium. The word translated rule here means to shepherd. These believers will shepherd with the same iron rod of Christ under his authority, which was given from the Father. Given the morning star likely refers to the close association of the ruling Christ, often referred to as the morning star. <clears throat> In 2 Timothy 2.8, we see this. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel for which I suffer trouble as an evildoer even to the point of change. But the word of God is not chained. Therefore, I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. This is a faithful saving, saying, for we died with him. We shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. And in Revelation 2.4, I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. And then Psalm 2.7. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. 
the rule of Christ will be very strict. Iron rods, smashed potters, vessels. The way I interpret this is during the millennium, sin simply will not be permitted. There will be an extremely strict standard to be met and failure to meet it will result in immediate consequences. The millennium is seen as like returning to the conditions of the garden, but that can't be possible if the sin natures of those who survived the tribulation and their offspring are allowed to run amok, thus the iron rod rule. This is how the turning of the other cheek spoken of in Matthew is possible. Retaliation not permitted. God will take action immediately for any wrong. The letter closes with the familiar he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Some see this as significant in that beginning with this letter, it comes after the exhortation. It is offered here to all who will hear, suggesting they have a chance to find their way out of this system. The church at Thyatira was seen as the corrupt church, one that introduced pagan idolatrous practices into the church that perverted the truth by commingling these false teachings of Baal with that of Christianity. The result was a breaking of the covenant relationship associated with the bride of Christ, spiritual adultery. With that came idol worship, and practices associated with adultery. Those of the church involved in this will suffer the second death, thus are not true believers. There was among this church some who remain faithful and they are known to Christ and will be rewarded with rulership roles in the millennium. Even during the church's darkest hours, there always remains a pivot of true believers. Now, moving on to the next church, the church at Sardis. Revelation chapter 3, verse 1, we pick that up. <clears throat> and to the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know your works, that you have a name that you are alive, but you're dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain, which are ready to die, for I have not found your work perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. And I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. <clears throat> Sardis is an ancient city located in Western Asian Minor, Asia Minor, about 50 miles from Smyrna and 30 miles from Thyatira, and was at one time the capital of the kingdom of Lydia. It was an important city and a wealthy city sitting on east-west commercial trade routes. Some of its wealth came from its trade in textiles and dyes and jewelry. Like most of the cities of this area, <clears throat> it was a very pagan city involved in the all too numerous systems of idolatrous worship with many mystery cults or secret religious societies there. The magnificent temple of Artemis dating from the fourth century BC was one of its points of interest and remains there as ruins. There is also ruins of a Christian church right next to it testifying to the post-apostolic Christian witness to this wicked and pagan city 
noted for its loose living. <clears throat> the church to whom the letter was written remained in existence until the 14th century, but was never very prominent. Today, only the small village of Sark exists amid the ancient ruins. And to the angel of the church of Sardis write, these things says he who has the seven spirits of God and seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you're dead. <clears throat> the letter to Sardis is one of rebuke and censor and almost devoid of any form of commendation as seen in previous letters. Sardis was a city of the worst kind of idolatry. One of the idols was the mother goddess Sibylle, or Sibyl. Two columns, 60 feet tall and over six feet in diameter remain of the temple to her worship. Worship to the god Dionysus usually involves sexual orgies and festivals dedicated to her. In previous letters, the Lord began with commendation and then shifted to condemnation. But there's not a word of commendation to this church as a whole. However, we will see that there remains a pivot, probably very small, which gets singled out for commendation. Christ is introduced as the one who hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, which is similar to what we saw in chapter 1, verse 4, where the seven spirits are declared to be before the throne. In both cases, we're looking at a word picture of the Holy Spirit as captured in the symbolism of completeness and per or perfection. And this is also seen in Revelation 5, 6. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though I, it had been slain, having seven horns, seven eyes, which were the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. These portraits of Christ picture him as having the qualities that qualifies him as judge. Christ is also revealed as the one who holds the seven stars previously identified as the messengers or pastors of the seven churches. We saw the same symbol, symbolism in regards to Ephesus. It makes it clear that the leaders of the churches are responsible to no human representative of Christ and must give an account only to him. We believe this is the picture of the church during the Protestant Reformation, which had an elaborate church hierarchy for which there is no support in scripture. Churches were intended to be independent and self-governing using scripture to edify its members. No other model is seen in scripture. Christ declares, I know your works. In his omniscience, he knows what is in the hearts of men. Christ goes on and says, you have a name that you are alive, but you're dead. You have a name refers to a proper name or calling, and they're called Christians. The word translated you are alive refers to eternal life. Literally, this seems to be saying you may be called Christians, implying you have eternal life, but you're dead. That word translated dead can mean lifeless, but it also means ineffective. This sounds to me like this church is being accused of being Christians in name only, and they are ineffective in their witness for Christ. The world today is filled with nominal Christians who do not possess eternal life. They go through the motions and have the physical trappings of Christianity, but they're no more born again than my cats and even less effective. This is a verbal picture of a spiritually dead and ineffective church, which pretty much sums up what the church had become at the time of the Protestant Reformation. <clears throat> William Barclay observes of the church. It is in danger of death when it begins to worship its own past, when it is more concerned with forms than with life, when it loves systems more than it loves Christ 
when it is more concerned with material things than with spiritual things. <clears throat> Revelation 3, 2. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain they are, that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. Strengthen the things remain. Evidently, there's something of substance is left in his church. And it is in need of strengthening as whatever remains is ready to die. The word used for ready to die is one that is usually used for physical death, but has strong spiritual connotations. There is an inferior quality to the works of this group. The word for perfect is one that means lacking or not complete. Robinson's word pictures of the New Testament puts it this way. Perfect passive predicate participle pleroso. Their words have works have not measured up to God's standard. The quality of the spirit, spiritual production of this pivot of believer is inferior, inferior to what it could and should be. Collectively, this is a picture of a church that is seen as barely functional, a pitiful shadow of his former self. But there remains just enough there that it is possible the downward spiral can be reversed. They are encouraged to remember, therefore, how you have received and heard, hold fast and repent. They are not so far gone that recovery is impossible, but that calls for recalling what they had received. I would classify that as two things, eternal life and doctrinal truth not the traditions of man. This calls for repentance, a complete change of mind. For that to happen, they cannot continue down this path and survive. Satan has a solid hold on this church, and it is going down for the count. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I come upon you. Watch is a Greek word that means to be vigilant or remain awake. We might say something like this today. If you don't wake up, if is in the Greek third class condition, meaning maybe you will, maybe you won't. Christ says he will come upon them like a thief, meaning it will be sudden and unexpected. Obviously, they do not grasp the status of their spiritual existence, so judgment will come out of the blue. You will not know what hour I will come upon you. This is the same language used for the second advent, which encompasses all associated with the second advent, which begins with the rapture. The judgment on Sardis will be sudden and unexpected. Verse 4. You have a few names even in Sardis who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. This church is dead or dying, but there remains a weak and a small remnant who have not defiled their garments. True believers are seen as dressed as white in eternity. While they are not spiritually productive as ought to be, they are born again. They have not defiled their garments. It is a reference to temporal activity and not their eternal white garments. They are resisting the idolatry and decadence of their fellow nominal Christians. Through their witness and spiritual production or less than it ought to be, they are born again and will wear white in eternity. Verse 5. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out, blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. These overcomers, victorious over spirit, sin, and death, 
who get to wear the white robe in eternity will not have their name blotted out of the book of life. And there are a number of positions on this, but I believe only one really makes any sense. And this is it. While it's clear from other passages that the book of life contains only the names of those who are saved, there are references to being removed or blotted out from the book of life as seen here. Based on one passage in 2 Samuel 12, where we have the account of King David mourning and praying concerning the pending death of his sick child by Bathsheba, we see David's attitude suddenly change when the child eventually dies, and this perplexes his servants. His reply suggests that David knew exactly where the child would be in eternity. And I refer you to 2 Samuel 12, 22. This is David's reply. And he said, while the child was alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who can tell whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now that he's dead, why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him but he shall not return to me. David will ultimately go to heaven, and there he will find the child he lost. I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. While this is not conclusive, and the Bible does not clearly state so, I conclude that every person born gets his or her name written in the book of life. We do not know that we do know that 1 John 2.2 2 says Jesus is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. All sins were judged at the cross, yours, mine, and the sins of the entire world. That suggests the potential for God to show mercy towards those unable to make a free will decision to accept Christ as Savior. We call this the point of accountability, and some die before they ever reach that point. If children and the mentally disabled, disabled who have not had the chance to make a free will decision to accept Christ as personal Savior, the point of accountability, then they will not be held accountable as suggested by David's comment in 2 Samuel. Obviously, David's child never had a chance to make a free will decision for Christ, or in this Old Testament context, to place faith in the coming Messiah and all that is promised concerning that person. I believe all names are written in the book of life, and those who demonstrate negative volition to the gospel message are blotted out of the book of life, as suggested by Revelation 3, 5, and 2015. This blotting out most likely occurs at death. Those blotted out of the book of life will face the second death. It is my position that God applies Christ's payment for sin to babies and those who are mentally handicapped. Since they are not mentally capable of understanding their sinful state and their need for the Savior, of this much we are certain, God is loving, holy, merciful, just, and gracious. Revelation 3 6, who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. <clears throat> so we have the usual close. We've been warned. We need to listen to what will be said by the pastor of the church, in this case, Sardis. The same is true for every century in every church. These warnings, while being addressed to specific first century churches who characterize such problems are for all churches in all ages. Any of us, either as a church body or as an individual believers, can fall into these problems and suffer the same failings and consequences. As a prophetic foreshadowing of the church in history, most see the church at Sardis as representing the church from about 1517 to 1790, which is the church during the time of the Reformation. 
when the great mass of Christianism were nominal Christians only and as spiritually dead as the church at Sardis is physically dead today. During these years, only a small believing remnant took their stand for biblical Christianity and trusted Christ as their savior. Those of the Reformation saw through the pageantry, the ritual, and the spiritual deadness of the Roman church and found biblical truths upon which they took a stand at the risk of their very lives. They struggled to regain the footing of faith and demonstrate the truth of the Bible, casting aside the traditions of men. The remnant who had not soiled their earthly garments came out of the dead church. Heeding the warnings of the church at Sardis, they held fast to what they had heard and repented, then strengthened what little remained. Some had an ear and heard what the Spirit said to the churches. <clears throat> and that concludes our session for today. We'll pick this up again next week. Uh, does anyone have any comments or questions? We are by stricken with uh, muteness. <laughs> With There's always an out. There's always an opportunity. You know, God always forgives, and no matter how low and bad and far removed you are from His Word, you go. You, you've always, always got an open door. You just have to walk through it. <clears throat> and I see that 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 common message in what we've read thus far in the last several sessions stated differently. But you know, in each church, there was a remnant. And, uh, and an opportunity. And I think that exists today and always will. Dead right, Chuck. <clears throat> and I enjoyed your interpretation of names blotted out of the book of life. I, uh, I haven't had time to research that, but, uh, but I thought that was a good explanation. There's not a lot on it in scripture. So I've, you have to draw conclusions from only a few passages, <clears throat> but that's that's what I see. And actually, that's what I was taught many years ago by another pastor I had. <clears throat> like, do you see any, uh, I guess, relationship between Isabel and the church? Jezebel. Jezebel, I mean, Jezebel and Israel and the church as believers, and that this reference uh, that ties higher is really talking about revelations in the end time where uh, Israel goes through because of their unbelief versus Jezebel, and the church is spared from the wrath, those are true believers. You know, do you see that context? And because what you see here, you talk about the toes, smash the pieces as potter's clay. That goes all the way back to Daniel in the statue in the last toes being tribulation where Christ uh, is formed and a stone comes out of the mountain and crushes the statue and it, it goes to pieces. So I guess my, my struggle here, well, my question is, is, is all this a reference really to the tribulation period uh, Jezebel being Israel going into tribulation and the church being spared from the wrath in tribulation. Uh, do you see that reference here or, or not? This, the seven churches have application not only in the first century <laughs> when this, uh, when it's in the second century when this letter, these letters were written, but it also has um, application throughout history. And I think you can extend history into the tribulation. And in, I think in the sense, what you're alluding to is Israel got caught up into following the antichrist. Right. As the Je Jezebel. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah. The, the other thing I thought was interesting is uh, within Acts, you know, we're in the, in the middle of that study and you had the first church council 
and the first church council ruled where you did not have to become a Jew and adopt Judaism to be a, to be a Christian. And I don't know if you remember any of that, but what came out of that was they wrote a letter back to, to uh, Antioch. And in that letter, they said, you do not have to convert to Judaism, but we ask you to avoid sexual immorality and those things uh, sacrificed, eating those things sacrificed to idols. And so I found that interesting how that, this is tying back to those exact almost words that's happening here in, in this church. And so uh, it wasn't a command that they were sinning as you went into that study, it was basically saying, don't do these things because they offend the fellowship because the Jews couldn't accept them in fellowship. So I see how all that's tied together. It's just a point of reference. I, I, you don't need to comment on it. It's just, it was interesting. Well, sexual immorality among the, uh, <clears throat> the heathen in those days was very common. And in fact, almost every one of the churches we looked at, we see ref have seen references to some form of that in their, their worship services. And that part was a, a warning not to get drawn into the idolatry that's associated with that. And <clears throat> then the, um, the part about not eating, we know that it's permissible for a believer to uh, eat anything. But the uh, the charge was to avoid doing that so that it doesn't become a stumbling block um, to those who might come into the church or be brought into the church. Yeah, and, and, and the reference here, again, this is just information. Uh, the reference here is that uh, in Antioch, what happened is they sacrificed stuff to idols and the meat was sold in the meat market. And so people were buying that meat out of the meat market that had been sacrificed, but they didn't know it was, and they didn't well, care. They knew, but they didn't. Yeah, but they didn't care because they weren't involved in that sacrifice or worship. <laughs> what they were involved in is buying the meat. And that was what they were trying to say. Even though that's not a sin, you know, to eat food sacrificed to idols when you don't know whether it was or not, it is really all. Uh, distested by your Jewish fellowship and you should not do that in their presence. Uh, and it all get into where- and It also wasn't kosher. It know? wasn't kosher. It gets into where Paul says, you know, when you know, when in Rome do as Romans. In other words, be careful about the people you're around that you don't offend them because then you break fellowship and your opportunity to your witness. So- in, mind, in, the, in the very early church, almost all of them started out in synagogues. Yeah. They, were, they were mostly Jewish uh, Jews that came to Christ. Right. And the, the um, charge was to avoid offending them. That's right. Exactly. <clears throat> All right. Well, I guess we will see you all next week. Thank you for uh, coming and participating. And we'll close with a prayer. Thank you again, Father, for the great privilege and honor that you've given us to uh, come together in fellowship in your word. We ask that your spirit uh, bring these things to mind, that we might meditate on them this week and uh, uh, bring them into our thoughts and uh, contemplate on the things that uh, you have shown us, that they might become a source a blessing and challenge for we ask these things in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Amen.